kind of a, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a different sermon today. And uh, let's just go to it. Four languages. I already prayed, but thank you, Lord. God, help us now. God, help me as I speak. Lord, let me speak everything you want me to say, Lord, and, and nothing you don't, I pray in Jesus' name. So, four languages. Anybody want to guess what the four languages are? French. <laughs> oh, oui, oui, oui. Je te plumerai. I'll do it. Okay. Let's talk about the biblical history of languages. The biblical history of languages. Let's see. Thousands of years ago, everyone on earth spoke the same language. According to the Bible, everybody spoke the same language. What language was that? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I don't even know if linguists have an idea of what language that might have been. One day, they decided to build a big tower, and this story is found in Genesis 11. So if you'd like to turn quickly to Genesis 11... Start, so verse 1 through 9, it says, Now the whole world had one language and co a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, which is like Babylon, and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord, you know, I wonder, you know, whenever uh, God, at the beginning at creation, he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, and, you know, fill the earth, basically. I wonder if this was in opposition to that command. Just a thought. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because in Hebrew that sounds like confuse, I think, confused, something like that. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So I don't know exactly what it looked like, but long ago, they were all, all people, all these people were together building the tower. They wanted to stay together. And uh, God decided, no, we're not going to do that. So he confused their language. So I don't know what this looked like, but maybe, you know, 10% of the people started speaking one language. You know, like, like. Mochi, mochi, <laughs> konnichiwa, whatever. And then another 30% started speaking and you know another part of the people was like buenos dias amigos i don't know but anyway so they god what is it god confused their languages now was this the origin of all languages no it wasn't the, this isn't where french came from and it wasn't where english came from because it's much more complicated than that but i do believe the biblical history that, these lang that God confused people's languages and different languages came out of it. Let's talk for a minute about the evolution of languages. Now, I have a language degree from the university, but that doesn't mean this is... I'm not an expert in this particular part, but anyway, nonetheless, languages are living things. They don't stay the same over time, okay? Language has changed, you know, even in the 200 or so years that this country has been exi in existence. In fact, you know, like with the internet, you know, we come up with new terms, the in, you know, technical terms, they come into our language, and, and certain words are popular this year that weren't so popular last year. Let's give some examples of the evolution of languages. So Brits, British people, British people don't talk like Americans. We're all speaking English, but we sure don't talk alike. Now, I assume that in the 1700s, we talked a lot more, the way we talked was a lot more similar. Now, I can go to England. Listen, I went to England when I was a student studying France. I went to England, and I couldn't understand what people were saying. I mean, you understood some of it, but I'd be like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> anyway, sorry. I went, to, uh, I went to McDonald's. I went to McDonald's in England, and I said, can I have some butter? And the girl goes, what? <laughs> and her friend had to translate and said, butter. Butter. 
I asked for butter, and she, they wanted butter. And anyway, I'd ask the guy directions, like, how do you get here and here? And he just went on, and I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> I didn't know where he was telling me to go, totally. So British and Americans, our languages have, our English has evolved separately. So, for an ex another example, Chinese, well, Chinese, for example, influenced Japanese even so much, if I'm not mistaken, that you know, the, Chi the Chinese would come to Japan at one point in history and they pronounce things one way and so the Japanese would pick up certain pronunciations. Well, a hundred years later or whatever, they'd come over again and pronunciations had changed and so they'd pick up different pronunciation. And it's just, it's kind of complicated. Let's see, English, English, what is English? Well, English is kind of, in a way, a mixture of Norwegian, German, and French along with some Latin and Greek and other languages thrown in. If I'm not mistaken, like 40% of our words come from, are, are related to French, but we, it's called a Germanic language. So anyway, language, languages evolve. They're complicated. Now let's look at different versions of English. I need a volunteer, a very brave volunteer to come up. Here, Ezra, come up here. Ezra's going to read three versions of English. He's going to read Old English, Middle English, and King James English. Are you ready? I want to see if you can identify. Let me know when you can identify the passage. Okay, this is all English. Right. Fedor or poor a ot on he on formal say pin the marga for go. Wait, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Any, does anybody have any idea what this says? This is old English, okay? The official, this is from the year like. Somewhere between 450 and 1150. Okay, so it's old. You'll figure it out on this one. This is Middle English. Middle English. This is from 1384. Are you serious? All right. Fadir, thy art in Hinnus. Hallowed be thy name. Oh. And then we're going to get it hundreds of years later in 1611, the King James Version. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Actually, actually, it's our Father, which art in heaven, okay. hallowed be thy name. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ezra, our, our English language expert. A round of applause. Ezra. So, so listen, even English, the language we call English in the last, you know, 1,500 years has changed a lot. Because that is like, ooh, wow, what is that? What was that? Sorry. Uh, that the Lord's Prayer from, you know, the year 1000 or 600 or whatever was incomprehensible. There it is. So, yeah, that, that like, if you go on YouTube, you can, uh, you can, or Google this, you'll find videos of, and you can hear people read it. And it's interesting to hear it. One guy is real dramatic. He's like, Father Ur. Pubeer <laughs> Tanarfana. <laughs> But anyway, so what did Jesus speak? What did Jesus speak? Well, here's, here, listen to what I have to say today. For one, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Everybody say Aramaic. So Aramaic was the language spoken in Babylon. But Babylon's not in Israel. Babylon is hundreds of miles away. Well, what happened was the Jews started speaking it when they went into captivity. The Babylonians and whatnot invaded and carried them off. And while they were there, they, were, they stopped he speaking Hebrew, and they started speaking the local language, which was Aramaic. Okay, Aramaic. Now, it, Aramaic, I believe, was the language for every day for Jews at the time of Jesus. So if you went, to Jeru if you went back in time and you went to Israel, or where J Judea, wherever, when in Jesus' day, people weren't going around speaking Hebrew all the time. They were speaking Aramaic, the Jews. So... It would have been spoken at home. This is the language that, you know, parents would have spoken to their kids in or friends would have spoken, et cetera, et cetera. So Jesus spoke Aramaic. Well, you know what? Jesus spoke Greek. Greece was not the most powerful nation on the earth. That would be Rome. But its culture was very influential. In fact, if I remember from my, like, seventh grade history class correctly, Rome came in and they took Greek culture and kind of adapted it some and spread it throughout the world. So Greek, Greek, does that sound right to you? Thank you. 
So Greek culture was very influential. And so I understand that Greek was the language of business. If you wanted to do business in the time of Jesus, you spoke Greek, okay? Uh, the, New the New Testament was, most scholars hold, was written mostly in Greek. So if you look in an original, ver an original version of the New Testament, it's going to be in Greek. However, Jesus also spoke Hebrew. Now, Hebrew was the traditional language of the Jews. It wasn't necessarily an everyday language by Jesus' time, remember? Because the, they'd stop speaking Hebrew every day around, you know, the time of the Babylonian captivity, around like 500 B.C., somewhere around there. So, uh, not, I, I'm not sure that all Jews spoke Hebrew. I mean, they, it's like, it seems like, well, they ought to. But now the Holy Scriptures were written in Hebrew. So I think that the learned men or the priests or whatnot, they, they spoke Hebrew. But anyway, Jesus knew the scriptures, so he must have known Hebrew. So, so far we got Jesus speaking Aramaic, Jesus speaking Greek, Jesus speaking Hebrew. Now, Jesus spoke Latin. Jesus spoke Latin. Why do we think this? Well, Rome was the most powerful nation on the earth during Jesus' time. Okay? And Rome ruled over Israel. Israel was not a free country. You know how, have you heard like, two bro like a brother and a sister and she's like, quit, what, I don't know, quit making noises or whatever. And he, then the boy goes, it's a free country. Have you ever used it? That's what kids say, it's a free country. I can do what I want. Well, Israel was not a free country because Rome ruled over it. Okay, now the Romans spoke Latin. And Latin is the language that French and Spanish and Italian would ultimately come from. These are called the Romance languages. There's also like Romanian and Portuguese and maybe some others. But anyway, these, these languages, like if you study French, it, it helps you understand Spanish. And if you know French and Spanish, it's easy to understand Italian, kind of. They're related because they come from Latin. But Latin was the language of the Roman government, okay, the Roman government. So, I believe it stands to reason that Jesus, living in a place controlled by Rome, was familiar with Latin. I'm not saying he spoke it fluently. But anyway, so here I've said Jesus spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, four languages. So what's the point? This is church. Why are we talking about languages? Well, the point I want to make today is this. Jesus knew how to speak the language wherever he went. I don't mean that if Jesus got in a boat and went to Africa, he could miraculously speak Swahili, okay? What I mean is, in other words, he knew how to act, whatever the situation. Jesus knew how to act in the circumstances that he was placed in. That's, this is my argument, my thesis today. So, whether it was a family context, a church context, a business context, or a government context... And I want to talk about that. So let's look at an example of each. So, family, family. Mark 5, Mark 5, verses 21 through 24 and 35 through 43. This is one story. And let's see if I can turn to it quickly. We can just go through this. Let's see. So Mark, Mark 5, verse 21. So it says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered there around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. This guy had to be desperate, okay, I believe. So Jesus went with him. So we're going to skip to verse 35, okay? It says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? They're like, it's too late. He can't heal her. She died. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. It says, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John the brother of James. Anyway, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. After he put them all out, and this is the important part, 
He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, this is it, ready? Talitha kum. Talitha kum. Which is Aramaic. This is Aramaic, okay? Which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. This is probably what her parents said to the girl every morning when she was sleeping in. Talitha kum, get up! Except Jesus said it a little differently, I imagine. He said, Talitha kum, and because she was sick, she's, she's probably dead, y'all. She was dead. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. So anyway, this is the point. The point isn't resurrection and healing this time. The point, or my point today is that Jesus told the little girl in front of her parents to get up. Talitha kum is Aramaic. Listen, he did not speak in a religious language that the little girl would not understand. He did not go back to the Hebrew and say, Baruch Hashem Adonai. He didn't say something in Hebrew. He said it in the girl's language. He spoke Aramaic, okay? I believe that Jesus knew how to act in every situation. He knew how to speak the language. He knew what to do. Let of the Spirit, he knew what to do. And in this context of family, it was just his closest disciples and the parents and the little girl. In this close context of intimacy, he knew what to say and how to say it. It happened to be in Aramaic. Okay, church, church, the religious context, the official religious context. Luke 2 Chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Let's look at that. Luke 2. two forty-one through 47. And listen to this. So this is Jesus. When Jesus was like 12, okay? So we just talked about a little girl who was 12. Now here's Jesus who's 12. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of, of the Passover, big Jewish holiday. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. So they went to the big city, the big city of Jerusalem, for this big religious feast. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. His parents didn't know. It says, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. So imagine you go on a road trip to New York City with your parents and with a bunch of your relatives, and then they leave and they drive for a day, and then they're like, okay, who has Jesus? Who has, your, who has you know, their kid? And like, well, we thought he was with you. Well, we thought he was with you. And they're like, what? <laughs> Where, you know, where's my kid? And so they got to get back in the car and drive all the way back, except they didn't have cars. So anyway, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they looked for this kid for three days. They must have been freaking out. Jesus, Mary's like, oh, or Joseph's like, I have lost the Son of God. God is going to kill me. <laughs> I have been so irresponsible. Anyway, no, parents love their kids. Uh, it says... After three days, they found him in the temple court. So he's at church. He's at church, okay? In the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. There's another point to that story. But look, Jesus was 12, and he was blown away, the, the teachers, by his understanding of, like, theology and the scriptures. He was saying stuff it's like, how do you, and they're like, how do you know this? Where did you, you know, and I believe that the, the scholarly language of discussion would have been Hebrew. Now, did Jesus speak Hebrew at 12? I'm not sure. But, but nonetheless, even in this context, well, okay, the Holy Scriptures were written in he, mostly in Hebrew, so he may have known them. Uh, anyway, even in this context, Jesus knew what to say and how to say it. Even as a little kid, even before his public ministry, even if he was speaking Hebrew, he knew what to do, what to say, how to say it. Later on, though, I'll just mention in Luke 4, Jesus... Oh, there it is. Oh, that's better. Jesus, 
Jesus gets up and he reads from the scroll. He reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me, etc. So Jesus spoke Hebrew. It was the language of church, okay? The language of church. Two, let's see, business, Matthew 25. I'll just tell you about this one. Jesus teaches a parable in Matthew 25. And he says, once upon a, something like this, once upon a time, there was a guy who gave his, his servants a bunch of money. And he said, go, go trade with it and then bring me back your profits. And so they went and one guy who had like five kajillion dollars said, hey, I made another five kajillion dollars. And then the other guy who had two kajillion dollars said, hey, I made a bunch more money. But then the last guy, he said, well, I just took what I had and buried it in the ground. And, the, and, the, and Jesus said, the master said, listen, you should have at least taken it to the bank so it would draw interest. You know, if, if, you, if you put money in a deposit account, the bank will pay you money, usually not very much money. That's called interest. It's a way of making money. I can put a million dollars in the bank, and every month or every year, they'll, t they'll pay me a small percentage of that. And that's interest. Well, listen, Jesus, as he told this parable, he knew, it showed he knew about investments. He knew about investments in return and profits and stuff like that. So Jesus, when in his ministry, he talked a lot about money. I think I've heard that he talked, he talked the most about love, but the second subject he talked about the most was money. Jesus talked a lot about money. He understood investment and return. Listen, he was probably in his father's like carpentry business growing up. And if he did business as a carpenter, then he probably, since, listen, Greek was the language of business. So Jesus probably spoke Greek and was like doing business with customers in Greek, okay? But my point for this one is Jesus, he was talking about business. Jesus had an understanding. He knew how to speak the language of business, investments and return and interest, stuff like that. Finally, government, government. So this is the last one, John 18, 33 to 38. And this is about the last scripture I'm going to read. Okay, this is the fourth language, and I do have a point. So let's see. But this is, an, if you read this whole passage, it's kind of interesting. So John 18, 33. Oops. John 18, 33. So Jesus, has, Jesus is going to be crucified, and he's been handed over to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the, was, represented the authority of Rome. He wasn't the top dog. He wasn't Caesar, but I, I guess he ruled over that area, that, Jew, that Jewish area, okay? So Pilate is there, and Jesus has to answer him. Jesus has to talk to him, and Jesus is not intimidated, Okay, Jesus does not freak out. Oh, the king, the Roman king, you know, the Roman governor. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, I think that if you watch the movie, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, this is going to happen in Latin. I didn't, I didn't go watch it before I preached this, but I think it's happening in Latin. Latin, the language of the Roman government. And Jesus says, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? And Pilate goes, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And Jesus says this, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And Pilate says, well, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? Now let's assume that this happened in Latin. Latin, they're speaking the language of Rome, Latin. My point still again, well anyway, Jesus was questioned by the Roman governor Pilate and he knew the right thing to say. And later on, you can read in the next chapter, Pilate asks him, and he just doesn't say anything. He just doesn't answer. So Jesus knew the right thing to say, even when the right thing to say was nothing. When it was time to keep silent, Jesus knew it. Okay? So my point here is Jesus knew what to say and what to do, how to act in the presence of the king, in the presence of 
the government, the authority. Of course, he was the king of all kings, but still he knew what to do once again in that situation. Now, let's see. I have a confession to make. I don't want to disappoint you. I didn't really come here today to give you a lesson in linguistics and biblical languages, although it is good to know about some of this stuff when you study the Bible. The truth is we don't know for sure what languages Jesus spoke. I mean, we, I think we have an idea, a pretty good idea, but, but scholars, look, the really smart guys that have studied this a long time, they don't, they, they're not 100% sure, they don't all agree what languages were going on. They're like, well, we think they spoke Aramaic, and he probably spoke Greek, and then some other guy say, they didn't speak Greek, you know, da, 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 that would have been bad, and then somebody said, well, they surely they spoke Hebrew, well, and then another smart guy will say, well, they probably didn't speak Hebrew, and there's this whole debate, and if you want to go online and read about it, you can. But I think it's, I believe that it's reasonable to assume that Jesus was familiar with Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. But the point, all that notwithstanding, the point of the lesson is still this. This is my point today. Your four languages. I believe that the Lord wants his people, wants us to speak four languages. And I'm not talking about English, Mandarin, French, and Spanish, okay? Although three of those would probably help if you live in Houston. Like Jesus, I believe we, shouldn't be, we should not be j just be competent to talk about religious matters. So look, Jesus could talk in more than one context. Jesus wasn't somebody who could go to church and preach real good, and then he was clueless everywhere else. Jesus knew what was going on in every situation. So, I believe, I believe, I hold that God's people should have wisdom in matters of family, business, and government, as well as church. Does that make sense? These are the four languages, okay? So, listen, people talk about, oh, I'm called. I'm called to the ministry. I'm called to preach. The fivefold ministry is not the only thing that God can call you to, okay? You think just, if you have a calling of your life, it's not just to be, it, there's more than just being an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher, or a pastor. There's more than that to callings. God could call you to be a baker. God could call you to be a mayor of a city. He could call you to be a homeschooling, stay-at-home parent. Okay? Preaching is not the only spiritual job. Preaching is not the only job that involves things of the Spirit. And let me talk more about that. Let me give you some modern examples. I'm kind of excited about this. Talk about my wife. Listen, I believe that my wife, it is the Lord's will and the Lord's plan, the Lord's call for her to work in a corporate environment. And do you know what her job that has to do with like accounting and oil wells or IT and you know the, the oil industry, she excels. She has favor. You know, I believe the Lord is with her. She has been blessed in this job. I believe the Lord get you know, I don't want to be sound too mystic, but I believe the Lord placed her there. The Lord gave her this job. And so she's blessed. I believe she's blessed in the place where she's called to be. Listen, I have a friend, Jack, who works for another oil company. I meet with Jack every Friday morning at a little men's prayer meeting thing. And Jack talks about how the past like nine or ten years, he's had such a struggle at work, but somewhere along the way recently, I don't know, he, he heard some teaching about God's favor or God's plan for business, and he started praying. And, and it's like, it's amazing the favor that he's come into and how he's, whereas before he was trying to keep a job, now other departments in his company are trying to get them to come work for them, trying to get him to come work for them. He has this favor, and he pr he'll like pray before a meeting, you know, and, and uh he believes in the, the Lord acting at his workplace. Th listen, years ago, I had a youth pastor, a youth leader. His name was Bruce. But his, his day job was being a, he built houses. He built houses, okay? He was a like a contractor or a framer. And I remember him telling me, you know, he's like, the Lord showed me, gave me insight on how to build houses better. You know, how to do things faster or better. He talked about the Lord showing him things, giving him insight into how to build a house. Can you listen to this? My friend Sam, that I also meet with on Friday mornings, 
He has dreams. He said, <laughs> he said the other day, or while, not too long ago, he went, he had a dream and Jesus was, was sitting in his office at this certain place in his office and uh, at a table and had his feet up. And Sam said, like, Jesus, what are you doing here? And Jesus said, I work here. And do you know, like after that, my friend Sam, he got moved. He moved from one office and he started sitting like at that exact table in that spot. It was like, ooh. So anyway, and or they'll have dreams, man. They'll, hit, they'll have dreams about what's going on in the company and divine insight or dreams about wisdom, what to do and politics in the company. It's kind of crazy. Let's see if I have another one. Then I have another friend, Mark, and he has this ministry that has to do with the federal government. And he goes and he prays, well, he prays for the federal government in America and stuff going on in our government. But he also goes up and he meets with congressmen and he ministers to them or prophesies to them or gives them encouraging words. So listen. Oh, yeah, here's one more. My friend Carol and her family. Carol's like a stay at home mom. And she told me, she said, I learned how to hear the voice of God when I was raising one of my children. One of her children was very difficult as a child. And she had to learn to hear God to get advice on how to handle this kid. And she said, I learned how to hear God that way. She said, she said like one time he lied. The little kid lied. And the Lord spoke to her, said, he lied. Spank him. <laughs> Spank him. He just lied to you. So listen, the Holy, the Holy Ghost involved in business, Holy Ghost involved in government, Holy Ghost involved in parenting. Who knew? Mark 13, 11, what does this say? Oh, this is what Jesus said. He's talking, he says, like, you will be dragged before, like, you'll be dragged before kings. He says, but don't worry about what to say, because what to say will be given you at that time by the Holy Spirit. Don't worry beforehand what you're going to say when you're brought before the king. So listen, the Bible says that if you are, have to go before the king in the name of the Lord, that the Holy Spirit can give you what to say. So our four languages. I'm not saying that just any Christian would automatically, automatically make a great president or CEO. Okay, I'm saying, this is what I'm saying. The devil would love for Christians to keep their noses out of every other sphere in the world. The devil would love it if we just stuck to church and didn't bring God into the workplace or into school or into uh, arts or media or any other thing. Because God made us to rule. God made us to have authority and influence. The so question is, what's your mother tongue or what has God called you to? What has God called you to in your life? Whether it's banking or accounting or being a vet or being a musician or being whatever it is, God knows all about that. God's not, a, God's not stupid when it comes to secular things, things like math and science and business. God can give you understanding about what he's called you to. What's more, I believe God has an anointing for you in your ministry, even if your ministry has to do with work, like selling cars or cutting people's hair. I believe you can have anointing and a calling to do this thing, okay? So whatever God has called you to do, you're not on your own. You're not on your own. He will be with you. So my, what I'm trying to say today, I hope I've effectively communicated, Jesus knew how to speak the language in different contexts, in different situations, whether it's had to do with business, government, you know, family, intimate context, or church. And I believe that the Lord wants us as a whole to be people who have, who excel in the various things that we're called to, even if it's being a doctor, or being a lawyer, or being a preacher, or whatever. I believe the, the Holy Spirit wants to help us, help us at school, help us at work, help us at our jobs, give us ideas. And, and through all that, I believe the glory of the Lord is shown and the kingdom of God is advanced in the earth. Here, this one preacher, he said, he the Lord blessed him in business. He, this is what he said. He said he used to witness all the time. At, he'd tell people at work all the time about Jesus and you'd get in trouble or get fired because instead of working, he was telling people about Jesus. And then later he figured out that if he allowed the Lord to help him in business, when he, did, he, he succeeded in business, he did so well in business that all his buddies came and wanted to know what his secret was. And then they started getting saved. 
Do you, do you see that? It wasn't that he kept talking about Jesus all the time. It's that he excelled at his business and they wanted to know how. Last thing I have to say is, Allez par tout le monde et prêchez la bonne nouvelle à toute la création. So this is French. And this says, Go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature, to all creation. So whatever you're called to do, God bless you in it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you made the world and you know how it works. You know how family works and friendships work and government and business and art and education and media and everything. So I pray for every person that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that each one of us would find the call that you have for us and the giftings you've placed in us and that we would walk in the anointing that you have for us and that we would go rock the world. We would go change the world for you. As, you, as we partner with you, Lord God, for your kingdom to come on this earth. God, help us to know how to be wise in the presence of kings and CEOs and professors and rock stars and every other context that we would be called to be in. Lord, bless everybody here, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And that is the end. God bless you guys. If you think of it, feel free to pray for Daniel Oaks. He's in China working at the orphanage. God bless Daniel Oaks. So, uh, band, I'll come talk to you in a second about this afternoon. So, thank you everybody for listening.